Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection, where we talk about great music with the people who make it and the people who love it. I am very pleased to be joined by Big Big Trains, Gregory Spot. And Greg, uh, Gregory, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Michael. So we're here to talk about your uh, new upcoming album, The Likes of Us. Uh, I've seen it called the 15th uh, studio album. I've seen it called the 16th. And I don't know if those people are, are thinking that uh, English Electric is parts one and two or, or oh. two or one. But what do you think of it as your 15th or 16th? Honestly, I have no idea. I gave up <laughs> counting a long time ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, are, there is some bafflement about our back catalogue. I think we unduly complicated things by uh, making that uh, sort of uh, combination of two albums into one and adding some extra tracks. So who knows? Who knows? Well, I think I'd rather have the extra tracks and the ambiguity than, uh, than not to have the extra tracks. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Think. Yeah, fair <laughs> point. Fair point. <laughs> Works out. So uh, either way, this uh, new album, The Likes of Us, uh, is set to release on March 1st on Inside Out Music. Um, very excited to talk to you about it today, but I wanted to start out the way I always start with my interviews, which is to ask you, what was your first favorite record? Ah, okay. First favorite record. Okay. Um, 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 can I cheat and just have two? Is sure. that possible? So uh, there was a the thing that, I, the track that, um, or the record that got me uh, buying music was by a, this will be a bit strange for you, but it's by a, a French kind of Jean-Michel Jarre type band called Space, I think they were called. And there was, um, they released a song called Magic Fly in maybe 77. Um, and uh, that was the first single I bought. I just like, I, lo I loved the, I just loved it. It was like a, almost like a disco-y proggy thing. It's really strange. And on the B side, I remember very well, there was a track called, um, ballad for space lovers and it was that track that i really fell for um so that was the first record i bought the, the first record the first long player i owned was i stole from my brother uh and just a few weeks later and that was called selling by the pound by genesis and it's still probably my top two three albums of all time even now so i kind of i may be guilty of um my musical tastes kind of getting fossilized when i was sort of 12 or 13 years old but you know that's just that's how it is that is how it is i think that's that's how a lot of us uh sort of uh had similar journeys so um you notice you know obviously you're you're a bass player but you play other instruments and i'm interested to know do you come from a family where there were always instruments around a musical family or were you kind of one of the first to to pick up a, an instrument uh, my my brother back to my brother again. He played drums in a in a in a punk band called Big Big Train. Funny enough, so there was a kind of um, a band. I, I I gave I suggested the title of the band to him, um, and then I pinched it back when his band folded. Um, but apart from that, there's no no musicality whatsoever in any anybody that I'm aware of in my family background um so my family background is a little bit complicated, and um, so I'm not entirely clear maybe a bit further back there's some musical uh musicality but but no as far as i know i'm the pretty much apart from my brother who dabbled for a year or so i'm pretty much the only musician uh to to uh to play so big big train as a name you uh you came up with this is was it from something did you just like the way yeah. it sounded so my family were my my um my family were on the railways basically so they they were in the east midlands um and my uncles and uh, my grandfather were railway men um and because of that there was always a always sort of railway paraphernalia around the house um and one christmas my my somebody bought me a train set called big big train um and you know it just I, for whatever reason i mean i love the toy obviously i've got rid of it when i was when i was um a little bit uh, older unfortunately they fetch quite high value now on second hand markets so that was a big mistake but um, there we go uh but i for some reason the name just stuck with me and when we were um throwing names in the hat back in maybe 1990 when when big big train the prog rock band began I, that was just a name i put forward and it was the only one that we could agree on um you know so i'm not it is what it is it's not i mean people some people uh, don't like the name of the band it doesn't really matter it's a it's a brand not a band and, you know that's what it is it just kind of you know it's got it's got to be memorable it's got to be those things and i think it kind of sticks in the in the mind well enough to serve its purpose 
what I like about it is that it's it it sounds like an English name, and your music sounds very English, very pastoral at times. And, and in fact, the the funny thing is, over the years, you've become a more diverse band in terms of different nationalities melding together, and yet you've retained this quintessential uh, Englishness about your music. And I wondered if that's because of shared interests or shared influences among the band members, or if it's just a, a conscious effort. I think I think probably the former. Um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, the band's roots are in progressive rock, in classic seventies progressive rock. Uh, there's no escaping that, and we don't try and hide from it. Um, now, the UK was the, you know, it was the sort of. Um, central point of the progressive rock revolution maybe maybe first of the beatles and then um you know coming through with king crimson and genesis yes etc um i mean there are other countries of clear, clearly that have um progressive rock uh, bands or pro progressive rock heritages canada the U us um italy uh, with pfm particularly had a, a very strong progressive rock heritage but the sen the kind of big bang situation began in the uk unquestionably and arguably with the king crimson's first album so i think that's i think that's just it i think it's a shared taste you know even though the bands spread across the world i think all of us have those as uh, those bands as an influence so ndv our american drummer you know his favorite drummer is phil collins uh you know it, it's so he's that's where he will connect back to so when we're making the sort of music that we do, I think our reference points are fairly clearly shared across the band. But we bring in, you know, it's a melting pot of influences. So we bring in influences from all sorts of different things. Um, you know, it's not just that 70s progressive rock sound. Um, it's other things too. Yeah. I think what ties it into that is there's a, there's a lot of callbacks to that that 12-string era genesis uh, in your yeah. music. Uh, which is, uh, you know, obviously it's very lovely. It's a, it, probably a direction the band would have continued in if Aunt Phillips had stayed in that band. So, um, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the, um, I mean, it's, uh, if they hadn't had Steve Hackett in the band, then they we maybe wouldn't have had further fifth that beautiful guitar solo. But on the other hand, we may have had even more of the twelve string stuff that Ant and Mike um, developed, and it is an incredible sound, and it's. Um, yeah, and I do. I love twelve string, and I do write a lot on a twelve string guitar. And the band, you know, we have a lot of twelve strings on stage with us. It's a very beautiful, chiming kind of sound. And and I guess that's probably that. And the use of Mellotron is probably the, um, and you know, maybe some influence on the chord sequences, etc. Probably where we most connect with that seventies progressive rock sound. I think. So tell me about no no pun intended here, but tell me about the genesis of Big Big Train and how it became uh, a thing, and and also how you pivoted a bit from being more of a studio band to wanting to play out and and be a band that plays live. So I mean, we started off as a band um, back in nineteen ninety, a very traditional five guys, local, playing pubs, that sort of thing. Um, but we didn't, you know, we were, I was still learning my trade as a songwriter, really. And we were, we made a couple of albums. We got signed to a label run by a band in the UK called IQ. It were fairly big cheeses on the 80s sort of prog circuit. So we felt um, at home there. Um, but it was really hard to keep the band, you know, we were maybe, I don't know, 25, 26. That was some people were getting married and having kids and all sorts of things. So keeping the the band going was really difficult. Um, and in the end, I mean, it kind of started with with me and Andy Paul, a friend of mine, and it kind of ended or seemed to have come to a, a end with just the two of us again. We kind of, after maybe 10 or 12 years, we sort of retrenched to two people with some people around us um, just trying to carry on making albums more out of stubbornness than anything, if I'm honest. It was kind of like a hobby, I think. Then... Um, we then we got a new singer called Sean Filkins and and um Sean had a, a good sort of proggy voice and suddenly we started selling thousands of albums and which from you know just a couple of hobbyists at home seemed to be a bit in, in, a bit preposterous really um but Sean certainly helped us along our way and then in 2009 I'd written an album called The Underful Yard um and I suddenly had a phone call from our studio engineer um 
Rob Aubrey, and he said, "I've I've got I've got a singer here. You need this is the guy. This is I found the singer for Big Big Train." And I, and I just said, "Well, I I'm not looking for a new singer. Um, we've got Sean, um, but he said, no, you really need to listen to this guy." So and his his name was David Longdon, and um, so I I listened to what David had recorded uh, in the studio for a solo album for one of the IQ band members and thought, okay, this guy's got a really soulful voice that would work with my music. Um, and so I started a kind of long distance relationship with him just on the phone, just getting to know him thinking, do I want to get to work with this guy? And then took the only, I think probably the only really hard decision I've made in, in my life with regard to music. And that was to, to, to let Sean go and to bring David on board um, I'm, still, I'm not proud of myself for it, but I just thought uh, at that point in time, it was time to really try to do the most with my music. I could see there was a good sense of direction, but I wanted to kind of, you know, start to make some headway with it. And then we put that album out, The Wonderful Yard, and suddenly it started selling in the tens of thousands of copies. And, um, you know, uh, it's 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 still one of our biggest selling records. Um, and it we brought on board a brass band. We it kind of def redefined the sound of what we were doing. It was that traditional seventies prog with a, the kind of colliery brass band thing. Um, it took off from there. And about three or four years later, we thought we started to think, okay, there's a lot of people who want to see us play. I mean, it clearly was an audience. It wasn't just a figment of our imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so we decided to play live in 2015 and, um, suddenly we were back in front of an audience, which, to my which was a long it was a long time since i had played a gig you know it was um maybe i don't know 15 years so getting back on stage uh was a bit of a shock to me um but i really you know i began to really enjoy it and i just could again see professionally it was becoming a career basically yeah um and that's where we were headed you know we were moving forward and then as you know david sadly passed away a couple of years ago so we've had to go through another change but that's the kind of story of the band in a nutshell, um, uh, you know, without bringing it right up to date. That's um, that's where we were. Well, I would say uh, David Longdon was, I think you probably will agree with this and and Rob would probably agree with Rob Aubrey would probably agree with this. But I think for me and many Big Big Train fans is where the band really developed its voice. I think David's voice was suited perfectly for the band. And you know, without Sean departing the band, we wouldn't have had his fantastic 2011 solo album. So I think it kind of worked yeah. out for everyone. Yeah, I was really pleased that he he um he he went away and made that album. You know, I he he um he he made a lovely album there. I think he's kind of drifted out of music recently, but I'm pleased that he made a, a statement of his own uh, on that basis. And we talk now, me and Sean. You know, we we um we bumped into a car park a few uh, bumped into each other in a car park a few years ago. And we sort of locked eyes, and I thought, oh, oh this could be trouble. You're quite a big guy, Sean. Uh, but we were, there was enough water under the bridge for us to both see that, you know, what had happened and why we did what we did or why I did what I did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, David, I, unquestionably, from the wonderful yard on, I think we'd found a way. I mean, it took me, I'm a, I was quite a, a slow starter with songwriting. And um, while some of my early efforts were pretty good, I, I really, it was kind of on the album, I think that, that, you know, I, I, I'm a kind of studier of things and I, I really try to learn the craft and that it is a songwriting is a craft, you know, there's no question. You can't just chuck stuff together. You've got a craft to do. And I think it came to fruition on that album. And then David became just as important a co-writer. And then we got Ricard and NDV and, and board. And yeah, and suddenly, well, I mean, it was like a Pinocchio story, really. The, the kind of um, the band started off as a real band. Then we became a studio project and then we became you know the Pinocchio thing became a, a real band again and uh the first I still remember that first gig we did in 2015 we came back and I walked out onto the stage and this sort of I think people it was a kind of disbelief that we were actually playing live you know so there's this wall of noise came at us very moving and um we all sort of just sort of stood there looking around this room as everyone was just going mad and that's before we'd actually played no you know it was um uh and it was it was quite exciting so so yeah, that's you know that's it, and um, you know I've I've become I, about five years ago I I I mean I had a day job until five years ago, and about five years ago I quit work and um, became a professional musician in my mid fifties, which is a slightly strange position to find oneself in. But I have I've always said to my kids, you know, don't don't ever think life hasn't got surprises for you, and they could be bad surprises or they could be good surprises, and so 
you know, I, I've, I've kind of lived with that over the last two or three years where, you know, I've had some really shocking things happening and also some positive things happening as well. So, you know, I just have to accept that's how that's how life is. You know, it's um, there's a surprise around every corner. Yeah, the likes of us uh, touches on some of that. Um, yeah, uh, this is your first album with a uh, new singer, Alberto Bravin, who uh, came from PF, uh, PFM uh, after uh, David Logan's uh, untimely and, and tragic passing. What, did you always know that Big Big Train would continue after David's death or, or was there some question about it? No, it was a huge question. I mean, in fact, I, I it was it, I couldn't even contemplate it um, to start with. It just it seemed. I mean, the whole I you know I cannot. Um, it, the thing is, that David wasn't ill, so there wasn't there was no. Uh, it, it was just that it was an accidental death, and and so therefore, there's no prepar you don't you've got no preparation, you've got no thoughts about what you're going to do or how you're going to respond to this sudden shocking situation. Um, David's partner Sarah reminded me. Um, that she'd had conversations with David to say, look, if something ever happened to me, you know, make sure Big Big Train carries on. So, so I felt like we had his blessing and Sarah's blessing, and that was important to me. But on the other hand, I, I wasn't, you know, I just thought myself, maybe this is, you know, I, how many bands have have been through the loss of such an important figure and managed to carry on? You know, I, I was scratching my head thinking about, it. But, you know, there are examples as ACDC, which was able to um to continue but there are other examples like the doors where you know it really didn't it, it didn't work for them at all um but i mean basically what happened is there was there was a meeting between me ricard and ndv and so ndv and ricard were the two guys that had been my close bandmates since two since 2009 or so and uh and our manager as well and, and my i went into that call thinking actually i do want to see if we can carry the band on but my I just the thing was if either of them were out, either Rick or NDV couldn't, then that was it for me. But we all felt the same. We all felt, you know, look, we we've all put our heart and soul into this music over the last few years, and we thought as long as we could find the right guy or girl, the, the right person to to you know as a new singer, then we will we'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. Um, so that's when we um, that's when we started the. Um, you know the discussions around who we would get into um to be our new singer tell me about alberto joining the band this is a, a person who uh, his voice obviously is different from david's but it's not a sea change it's not a complete 180 and it's also yeah. a, a voice that i feel is very similar it has some very similar characteristics to nick's voice so when there's harmonizing there's a, a very close um ability to to meld those voices together yeah the, the harmonies are really are really beautiful and um i mean we're very lucky with the singers in the band we've got a number of we've got oscar and we've got claire and, and ndv and rico they can all sing as as front persons on, on their own so we we you know we, there's a lot of as you've heard on the album there's a lot of sort of big harmony moments there um i th i i saw him playing with pfm um i was just like wow you know that was that i didn't know who he was you know and in fact at the time he had short hair so um that was 2015 so i just was watching pfm and you know i know the backstory of the band but i didn't know who this young singer that who stood at the back of the stage behind a keyboard uh was and he was singing the, the more difficult technically difficult songs and I just thought, okay, this guy's amazing. So I just wrote his, in fact, I didn't write his name down. I didn't know what his name was, but I just wrote PFM singer on my phone because I've been thinking for many years I might do a solo thing and, and who would I like to work with. So I kept a list of names, different musicians and, and stuff on, on my phone. So when we decided to 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 really start looking for um for a, a new singer, I Alberto was literally the first name on my list. I had subsequently found out what his name was um so but actually he hadn't got much of a social media profile so tracking him down was quite difficult uh in the end i managed to get an email through to him and um it was it was a phishing email it wasn't like you know would you audition for big big train it was have you ever heard of big big train and he was like god oh, dude you know i love your band um i don't think he, i don't think he knew why why i contacted him but that so then i just said would you fancy auditioning and that was a big a big a big decision for him because um you know at the end of the day okay in pfm he was this he was the vocalist keyboard player 
and it was the band was run by some of the older band members um but it is the greatest progressive rock band in italy you know and and they were doing you know one year they did like 120 gigs so you know he was really busy with them um so it was a big decision for him even if he'd passed the audition did he want to join a a, a band that hasn't quite got the uh, reach of pfm or the or certainly the backstory of pfm um anyway he, i mean we auditioned quite a few people um alberto was the strongest audition for me um, I've told the story before, but one of the most important things was um, I was just listening to uh, one of the audition things of one of one of the new songs actually, which was on the new album. And um, my wife walked into the room, and and Alberta's voice was the one that was, and she just stopped and said, "Him," and and that was really interesting for me because I thought that's because Kathy's not a prog. My wife's not a prog head, you know. She mm -hmm. just likes good music and i thought okay so this is a voice that i think can cross that divide from the prog audience to just a more general audience which is really important because i think one of the mistakes that progressive rock bands more contemporary progressive rock bands make some of them is that they don't focus on the quality of the vocal performance they they have kind of vocalists rather than singers whereas if you go back to the classic prog bands of the 70s john anderson peter gabriel phil collins uh, John Wetton, you know, they were real singers and they, they, you know, they could have sung in a pop band, they could have sung in a prog band, they could have sung in the Beatles, whatever. Um, and I think it's really important if your music is complex and it's lengthy and you're asking a lot from listeners, at the end of the day it is rock music. Um, and I think it's therefore important to have points within it that will grab you fairly instantly. So that was a big moment for me when Kathy was going him. Um, you know, I do trust my wife's judgment. And also uh, from the other side of the coin, uh, Alberta's wife, Nicole, was pushing him too. She was saying, this is a great opportunity. You know, you need to you need to go for this and do the audition quickly. Don't spend weeks doing it, you know, like perfectionist stuff. Just get it back to them because they want to hear what you can do. So that just goes to show partners, wives, husbands, really important in personalities, in musicians' lives, in everyone's lives, I know. But, you know, they, mm -hmm. uh, the advice that they give to, to us um, when we sort of kind of um, in the middle of things, it can help just to clear the fog a little bit, I think, and just get to the point. So, uh, yeah, you know, he passed the auditions. Um, we, I started to meet him on Zoom like this because he's in Italy and I'm, I'm in the UK and um, – started to develop a friendship with him we came over he came over to um to kind of meet the rest of the band and do a photo shoot and all those sort of things and then we took it from there really and um he's been yeah he's been he, he's been brilliant you know he's just been he's a great guy he's a really great human being he's had to step into some big shoes with with you know with the loss of david he's been very respectful of that of the backstory of the band mm -hmm. um but he's starting to find his own you know he's starting you know we played quite a few shows last year and he's his own personality is coming out now and that's lovely to see because i'm just stood there watching him just sort of grow as a front man so so yeah it's been you know i you know i've been through some tough times and and i, I try to take joy and pleasure in life where i can and watching alberto um, you know my friendship with him growing and watching him grow as a front man has been a real a real dear thing for me so let's talk about this record a little bit you're on inside out music now you were you were um <clears throat> staunchly independent and now you're yep. on inside out to to get a little bit more exposure how, how has that transition been for the band it's been absolutely brilliant i mean i, I, I yes we have been very staunchly independent and i was I have to be honest a little bit reluctant very careful didn't want to lose our you know lose our control and all those things but they've been awesome um you know i'd, I'd got to know thomas varber who's who's the kind of um head on show there um over the years anyway uh, he's a very plain speaking german guy you know as, as german guys can be and uh, i value that you know he just says what um says what he thinks um but doesn't hide it you know and i mean english people tend to kind of say what they don't think almost and you know you sort of get there eventually but but he's just like straight to the point so and at this stage of my life i think that's great and yeah we've got an AR guy called freddie who's just awesome and um we were up at sony music last week and uh uh you know just in the offices and chatting to them and they're just completely behind us you know and they're not trying to change us they know what they've signed they know what we can deliver um and you know we've, we've got this 
album coming out soon. We've got a, a live Blu-ray coming out later in the year as well. Again, that will be through Inside Out. So, and then the, the other important thing is, so Sony in Japan, uh, Inside Out's and, uh, underneath um, Sony, they've got completely behind this release too. So, therefore, we're getting a dedicated release in Japan. Um, the Japanese language bonus track, which which was fun to do. So, I just feel that we've got a bit more heft behind us. You know, I feel the transition has been very natural. But I feel we've just got some industry push now, which is which is good for the band, I think. Yeah, and the good thing about Inside Out is they're they know they understand progressive rock, they understand the audience, and they understand the music, and that's famously not been the case with a lot of uh, record labels. I totally agree. I, that's it. And and you know, one of the, I mean, when you read the history of rock music, it's extraordinary how labels can be so short sighted. And as as progressive rock began to sort of fall away from, um, uh, you know, from popular well actually it was it was as popular as ever but but the the labels were pushing for you know new things new wave music to, the, the way they were trying to push bands that were great at doing what they did into something that they weren't they were not so good at it was just madness but it was just short-sightedness and um same thing happened in the 80s you know the 80s the the, the sort of second generation of prog rock bands came through but quite a big scene in the uk not not elsewhere but in the uk it was big with maroon mm -hmm. and all those other bands but again, they were pushing the bands to be things that they weren't, and uh, you end up with a just not so good vibe, not such a good album, all of those sort of things. And I think record labels have learned that over the years. And um, I can't speak more highly of Inside Out. You know, they've been great. So for this record, you guys got together uh, in Triste, Italy, uh, at an urban recording, and you recorded this together as a band and rather than file sharing how long had it been since you had ever recorded a record like that well we've we actually being all in the studio together at the same time probably not since 1997 or something you know it's a long time since we've we worked old school um we were i mean we'd always you know, it, it wasn't like it was all file sharing. So when NDV would NDV would often record the drums in the UK, and we'd all be in the studio with him, and you know, shouting out suggestions, a bit more hi hat there, Nick. Um, you know that sort of stuff. Um, so we were often together, but we but actually just recording an album all in the room together. I don't remember doing that for twenty years. You know, it's um, it's an incredibly long time. So we want, again, we're embracing change and difference. And, you know, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. We had to find the right studio and um, Albie, Albie lives in Trieste and suggested Urban. Uh, important thing is got a big recording room there. So therefore we could all set up as a band. Uh, and we were just literally, you know, staring each other in the eye and recording in a, in a big room like, it, like bands used to do in the 70s. And I feel that's given the album a bit more of an edge to it. Um, but more importantly, it was two, were two things. One is we could change arrangements just on the dime. You know, we would immediately just say, we'd stop a song um, you know, 15 minutes into a 17 minute song or something and say, can we try this bit like this? And then we could just communicate like human beings rather than across the internet where it may be 20 emails before you get to your point. Uh, and then we could just change something like that. Absolutely perfect. Uh, and the other thing was, I think it was just, it was the making of the band when we needed time together. Um, and it was the making of us, you know, the remaking of us, I suppose, because we could just work for two or three hours, go for a beer, come straight back in, do some more work, go for a beer. You know, you would literally, you were 150 yards away from the city centre. So it was just, it was a wonderful uh, environment, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we, I think, I don't think we'll ever go back to recording an album remotely again. I think we'll all always be in the studio together now from this point on. How does a big, big train song start? How does, how does the writing of a new song begin? Is it, is it you? Is it anyone in the band contributing an idea? Yeah, that's, good. that's a very good question, actually. Um, so it could be any of us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, sometimes you're working and you're not necessarily writing for big, big train um sometimes you think okay there's a there's a there's a missing link on the album here that we need to to fill so you're writing for a purpose so, so a couple of examples there there's a the next single will, will be love is the light um which is a song by primarily by Albie, and i helped with some of the words on that but there was a that was a song he'd had for a few years um 
he hadn't found a home for it. And the version that he originally had was very different from the version that ended up on the album. But he could hear, he, you know, unpicking the arrangement that he had, he thought, actually, this sounds like it could be a big, big train song. So he sent it over to me and I immediately fell in love with it and said, you know, can we just get a middle eight worked up and all of those things. Um, another example is uh, the long piece on the on the album. I, I I and I I we all knew that we needed some. There was something missing. We had about forty five minutes for the album, but we needed another track. Not necessarily a long track, but we just felt we needed something else. So I I I wrote that in. I had a couple of months in Rome, and I wrote that in Rome. I just bought a Torsten guitar first day I was there, and spent two months writing it. I had a bit of music from NDV and I sort of wrapped the writing around it. Uh, and I just, I mean, and honestly, you know, it was written and sung into an iPhone um, and that's how the others were hearing it. It was, it was, it was not a, um, the elaborate arrangement you've got now developed later on. Um, it was, it was as humble as, as you can be just one man who can't really sing very well um, singing into a phone and um with a guitar and that was it like busking you know some ideas and stuff so that's i mean there's various routes you know and some things will some things will arrive really fully formed and some things will uh be much more sketched out and yeah, can you do something with this can you take that away that sort of thing so it's there's various it's various ways we go about it and what about lyrics like it is, is everyone involved in lyrics or is it one primary lyricist uh, they are. I probably, I'm probably the primary lyricist. Um, uh, NDV wrote the lyrics on one song called Oblivion, and Albie's lyrics are on the album as well. Because for a couple of his songs, well, certainly for Love Is the Light, I um, he had the draft lyrics, but he wanted me to help him finish them off. Um, so that's a, a co-write on lyrics. But otherwise, I think everything is mine i think if that's right um so gen so generally i'm uh i'm one of the key sort of lyric writers i suppose and um mm -hmm. well, one of the other songs is, that was co-write with albi was um called miramare and he gave me the idea for the song he you know he suggested the subject matter um and and also he'd improvise some words and sometimes when a singer's improvising sometimes they just get a phrase and you think okay that that phrase I need to find a way of working around that phrase because I can hear in the singer's mouth that's a really strong phrase. So sometimes you you know you're trying to grab lines and then work lyrics around it. Lyric writing is a really interesting subject because um, you know it's more the amount of times I'm writing and I'm thinking if only I was a poet because then you can free yourself up uh, it, with lyric writing. You've got to think about. Uh, a number of different things and of course is the kind of meter of the song but also how does it sound in the singer's in the in the singer's mouth uh and there was a couple of moments on the album where we were you know batting ideas around and uh there was one song where albie said can i just reverse these two lines because it just i it i can't get it to sound right if it's that way around and i looked at the lines and actually they work in reverse as well it was it was a kind of just a descriptive passage mm -hmm. so it's a real you know it's a it's a, again it's crafting you know you you craft away your lyrics you try and get them to sound right you try and you, i want people to be able to read them and think that that reads really beautifully but also the singer's got to be able to sing them and not feel like he's got too much of a mouthful of words to get out all of those things so it's a quite an interesting discipline and um uh you know i, I do my best um and as do the rest of the guys in the band. And I think we sometimes get some some pretty good results. Now, the themes on this record are, are it's largely about loss and it's about friendships. And and you, obviously, during the, the making of this and beforehand, uh, suffered not only David's loss, but also a, a family member, your stepdad passed, and my condolences yeah. uh, on both of those losses. Yeah. Um, what in, is, is that the kind of thing that informs a big big train album do you start with an idea or a theme or a sound that you want to work around because you your albums have great cohesiveness and it doesn't sound like you've just compiled enough material to put an album out no um that's right we, we try to make sure things i think all of our better albums are where we've really worked it through and tried to create something as a single piece of art rather than a collection of songs 
Um, this is a, this is a bit this is unusual for us because I think a lot of our albums in the past have been st third party stories, really. So I'm always on the lookout for interesting tales, you know, as was David, things that we can write about, um, stories from local communities or, or whatever. Um, but this album, with the exception of Miramare, which is a, a story in, based in Trieste, a history story in Trieste, um, the rest of it is incredibly personal. And and it, it was simply that at this point with the the two major losses that I've had in my life, and also Alberto had been through a, a tough time in his personal life as well, it, it didn't feel honest or real that we could write about some other subjects that were not about what we'd experienced so that was that that was it and you know that that's the thing this this band this album is a much more personal thing and i hope people will respond to it in a way that we did when we were recording it you know we got very emotionally engaged when we were recording the the album um, because it is from the heart this one and i'm sure the next album in fact we've been talking about doing a concept album for the next uh thing or, or some of it being concept so we'll we're going to go back to doing you know stories that are not about us but i think for this album i think people will hopefully forgive us that you know we needed to write about our lives rather than um you know rather than other people's lives i know not only do i think they'll forgive you but I, i'm sure that when you you started taking the stage with alberto your fans were extremely supportive of just having you back and and knowing what you'd all been through because you'd been through the same thing that they'd been through they lost david as much as you guys did that it was exactly that and um you know it was as keenly felt uh outside the band i mean well different emotions i suppose but they david was an incredibly popular guy and it was always he was always approachable to fans you know he was always he always liked to socialize and talk to people and he always make people feel that he cared about what they thought and and said etc um so yeah it was a it was it was um, I mean, I can't tell you how difficult it was for our fan base as well as for us, um, and for us to. And I know it's difficult for other people, for for the listeners. I mean, they were putting a new lineup and a new singer in front of them, and we're asking them to keep listening, and that's all we can do: it, keep listening. Um, and if they choose not to, then that's fine. I've got no, you know, that I'm not, that's, it's not for me to determine whether or not they think it's appropriate that we carry on. But I noticed during the last tour, uh, which was 17 shows, I could see during the tour that people were really taking Alberta to their heart, you know, and you can get the vibe on stage was so positive and we were all having a, a lovely time together. And, um, uh, and, you know, as the tour progressed, people were, taking ownership or feeling increasingly possessive towards Alberto, which is a lovely thing because as I said, he's got an incredibly difficult job uh, replacing a much loved front man. And, um, you know, my hat's off to him for how he's, how he's done it. You mentioned Miramare and that's a, a song that's um, over 10 minutes long, but you've released it as a, a video recently uh, or did video for it. Um, how do you determine what songs that you're going to put out? I mean, you're, you're a band that obviously has a lot of long songs. Uh, the Beneath the Mass is over 17 minutes. Um, how do you determine which songs? Or is that a, a, a label uh, thing since joining Inside? Uh, I, th I think it was a discussion between us and the label. Um, uh, initially, the I think the initial conversation was let's have two singles. And probably that was going to be the sort of yin and yang thing with Oblivion being one of the heavier rock songs on the album and Love is a Light being the ballad or one of the ballads. Um, but I think the I, from our point of view, the problem is that showed it didn't show all sides of the album. It didn't show you know, kind of more proggy side of things. So Miramara, we thought was a good, excellent choice as a second single, just to kind of I think reassure people almost um, that you know the core identity of the band. We haven't drifted away from our roots. Um, we're always going to be going to be interested in progressive rock and and um you know following in the traditions of the band we're going to evolve we're going to change you know buns should do that they shouldn't stay locked in one place um but i think we just wanted to to reassure people with that second single miramare and then the third single will be love is the light which uh, i think hopefully will be quite a popular popular release people have heard it live anyway but um but i think when they hear the studio version they're going to really like it well i can i think i can put 
people's minds at ease. This sounds like a big, big train album to me. It, uh, you, know, you haven't lost uh, anything off your fastball in terms of progressive rock. So thank you. Um, thank you. The 17 minute epic beneath the mask. This is a, um, you know, this is one of these grand sweeping epics that you guys are known for. Uh, tell me a little bit about the genesis of this because it it is it is quite a centerpiece and it and it it is a very moving piece of music. Yeah, it was um, it was a challenge to write. Um, I didn't know, as I said a few minutes ago, I didn't know that it was going to be as long as it was. Really, I I didn't I, I didn't I didn't sit, I, I think it's a mistake to sit down and think, oh, I've got to write a uh, an epic. It doesn't work. Like, it should never work like that. Um, but it but as I was telling the story within the music, um, you know, it began to feel like a, a more hefty sort of piece of music. And then with the experience of my stepfather as well, I, I, I kind of knew I kind of knew what I was writing about when I was writing the music, but I just needed to find the right sort of metaphor to to kind of get me into the into the body of the song. And it, it began to coalesce around these um, huge television. I don't know if you have these in the States, but we have these huge television transmitter aerials in, in the UK. I guess you do. Um and they're like, you know, they're like 500 feet tall. They're huge things. And um, I seem to, my childhood seemed, I lived, I was growing up in, in the Midlands in a town called Sutton Coldfield. And my childhood seemed to, uh, everything that happened in my childhood, I could almost see literally these big masts in the background um, sort of blinking away because there'd be red light on top of them. Um, and when my stepfather was dying, I was driving back up to the Midlands from the South Coast um, to visit as often as I could. Um, and it just, the, it, it, the the hospice that he was in was right underneath one of these masts, one of these two masts that um, I grew up near. So I was driving past it every day and it began, it just began to feel like the metaphor for the song that, um, that these big guide wires that were sort of holding me down to my roots with my stepfather and the Midlands were beginning to sort of almost um be broken and torn away and i was kind of i felt sort of a bit lacking in uh, in connection to to how i grew up and, and all those things so that got me writing about my childhood and i tried to take the song through um you know to to the point where my stepdad died and then um i didn't want to be trite but i didn't want to i didn't want the song to be incredibly bleak so as much as I could, I tried to write an ending that was um, uplifting. Is maybe the wrong word, but but certainly had a made people feel that life life goes on. I mean, we all have to deal with these things, all of us, um, and you have to pick yourself up and try and get on with life. And so there was, you know, the sort of spring around the corner thing metaphor that I used in the last few bits, uh, which kind of gives it hopefully a, a more uplifting ending than the earlier parts of the song it was very when we recorded that it was i mean there were a lot of tears in the studio it really was a very emotional experience for all of us actually so um you know i think i hope that listeners will hear that when they hear the 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 song uh, for real yeah as i said it's very moving and, and i have to say with the uh the background story of your your finding that metaphor i hate to break it to you gregory but i think you are a poet ha thank you <laughs> that's really sweet um you know i i think um uh, I think I just I just try and find things that enable me to say things, and it's hard sometimes. You're saying things. The more you read, the more you you struggle to find things that people haven't expressed in their own way um, or in previous ways. So it's it's sometimes difficult, but sometimes you just have to get to the heart of the matter. And um, the sort of I mean, my, my stepfather died in as spring was coming, so you know it. it I, it kind of led me to that conclusion. Okay, you've got to pick yourself up and get on with your life because there's nothing else you can do. And it so happened that you know there's a time of year when you start looking to the future and and um, some maybe happier days. So I, I, you sometimes you just led to those things and you just can't avoid them and you just have to to run with them. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I, as I say, we do we do our best to try and get some meaning into the into the words. You also brought up this song, Oblivion, the first single. This is a song that I've heard you in another interview say that this song was about uh, sort of being an outsider or misfit type of person. Yeah. Um, as as Neil Peart put in the uh, the song Subdivisions, the the, the dreamer yes. or the misfit. 
Um, yes. now, what what was that? What was that like for you personally uh, in terms of of creating that and and uh, and writing that song? Well, I, I, that, actually, subdivisions is a really good. Um, you know, I, I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me, but that's exactly what we were sort of looking to write about uh, in that song. And I think the um, that song and there's a song at the end of the album called the Last Eleven. I think they're about um, about people ourselves. I mean, when I grew up, I felt like the thing, I went to a boys' grammar school, and it was a real. It's quite a tough environment at the time, and you know, you had these sort of hulking great rugby players who were the kind of cool kids in the school, and I was this kind of long haired, slightly rebellious young young lad. But I, I didn't feel like I, you know, I felt like on the outside, like I was on the outside of things. Um, but then you, if you find your tribe, the people that you get on with, the people that that are in, have shared similar interests, etc. And that's what happened to me. I found myself with a group of friends who who I've reconnected with in recent years, who've be, you know just you know been in the early stages of my life in and more later stages. And that's what we were writing about in Oblivion. We were writing about, and it's actually NDV wrote the lyric on that one, but it's a, it's about those kids that maybe are not the cool kids, but we can all, all of us um, can bring something to society and to humankind. Um, and I think it was just a, almost really, a, a, you know, like the, yeah, the rock kids. It's I was reading Geddy Lee's autobiography recently and he, he talks about it. He's a yeah. Jewish upbringing, so uh, very much an outsider in it, you know, in the place that he's being brought up, and also into rock music. So again, that sort of feeling of being an outsider, but finding your your bandmates, your tribe, all those things. So that's what we we're trying to do on on that song and on bookmarks was just to kind of really say to people, uh, sorry, that song and on last time, just to really say to people, there are other people out there that are like you, and if you find them, you can, you know, you can thrive. Yeah, I I just finished that a few weeks ago too. Uh, the Getty Lee's uh, autobiography. It's that chapter three is very difficult to get through with the. the it's it's extremely difficult, and um, you know, I think in fact a lot of it's very difficult. I, I actually I'm listening to it on an audio book, and um, you know, I've been walking by the river down here, and a couple of times I've been you know in floods of tears. It's really it's it's an extraordinary emotional thing, but it's fun as well. You know, I think that's the. The great thing about the book and about Geddy is that you know he again he's experienced incredible highs and incredible lows, and he writes about them in such a sort of profound way. So I think it's one of the best rock biographies I've ever read. Yeah, same. Really cool. The uh, the album here, uh, the likes of us. Do you have a, a favorite track or something that you're particularly proud of on the album? Uh, do I have a favorite track? Um... No, I don't. I don't think I have a. I don't. I you know I. I'm rehearsing here for some live shows and playing, you know, we're playing a couple of them and I enjoy playing them. I enjoy playing everything really. There's one that I, mean, I come back to a song called bookmarks, which was, uh, I, I particularly enjoyed that because that was the first half. Of it was just me and Albie, me on 12 string, him on piano. And we recorded that live, you know, I was in a little booth and he was on, on the piano, on a grand piano. So it was quite an intimate experience because we were eyeballing it. You know, there was, it was no click track, the, the the second half of the song's got a click track because the drums come in, but the first half of the song is just the two of us, and it was really, it was quite an interesting experience. Just sort of just trying to make sure you're in time. I mean, you've got to play you've got to play the notes right, but also you've got to play them in time. And doing that live like that was quite interesting. So I'm quite fond of that. Um, but also again, that speaks about my friends, my close friendships, and all those things. Um, but yeah, no, I I don't you know it's a strange thing. You know, it's like having it's like choosing your favorite child or something. You can't really do it. It's um, you know, we're fond of them all, I think. One of the fun things about this record is it's mixed in spatial audio by Bruce Sword of, of Pineapple Thief. Um it, it's as a person who loves five point one surround uh, mixes, I, I'm I'm very happy about that. And obviously it's uh, available on vinyl as well. So uh, you know, what was the have you had you been wanting to do more with five point one um format? Yeah, I mean that's the um, that's been the benefit of uh, the inside out deal that is levered in some funds to help us um, to to put this out in Dolby Atmos. Uh, I, I'm a newbie to Atmos. Um, in fact, all of us are. So we we Bruce was recommended to us by the record label. But, uh, the the funny thing with Bruce was, uh, Bruce is kind of you know he's he's got an in, his band is kind of an indie prog band. But when I went up to his studio to have a listen to what he was doing, it turns out he was a big. Anthony Phillips, 
fan and he loves 12 string guitars and all those things so i immediately felt like a kindred soul there you know i, I thought okay he knows what we do and he can he's sympathetic to our music so it's been a lovely experience and in fact i've just persuaded my dear wife to um invest in some atmos kit here so we can um enjoy things uh for real uh yeah it is i mean it's it's, it's someone was describing it to me the other day i was just someone describing it and it is it, it it's actually no it's albie because he, he's been to a couple of studios and been sat in on some classical stuff and it is like being when the room's set up well um it's like being in the middle of the band you know there's no other way of describing it and i, I don't i'm not into sort of whizzing around you know sound effects and stuff i just want to hear the music and i want to hear it in a way that stereo doesn't give you and the funny thing was for me or the or the most convincing moment for me was we went up to um sony a week or so ago and had a listen in to the blu-ray in their one of their listening rooms and this room has got they had 30 speakers in it all genelec so studio level speakers and 100 100 grand maybe to set this room up uh and it sounded incredibly immersive and then he, the the girl that was running it just switched back to the stereo for a moment and i was like oh you know suddenly <laughs> the stereo felt like you were put in a little box and of course if you're listening on headphones I'm, I'm sure that's fine but um but in a room in an environment like that and not all of us can afford 30 speakers 30 genelec speakers of course but um in fact, not, not, I don't know anybody that could, um, but it's you know you don't have to be at that level. We heard it in a in a um, in a more you know with a soundbar room, and that sounded great as well. So uh, yeah, we're we're looking forward to it. You know, we're going to be doing uh, you know with with uh, inside out support. We'll be doing every studio album with uh, an Atmos mix. Excellent. How many uh, is this a three record deal? Uh, well, I think it, um, I don't know what the deal is actually because we have we have. I'm sorry to sound so. Um, uncertain of things but we have a manager that deals with those things okay. <laughs> um so i i you know i i i don't know i have no idea all right uh fair enough uh, this album when somebody buys it they come home put it on maybe vinyl maybe they get the the blu-ray um what do you hope that they take away from that listening experience at the end of listening to this album i, I want it we all want it to be an album that you can't turn off so I, I that's that's for me is the mark of a good album when you maybe want to maybe you just think i'll listen to the first couple of songs but then you get drawn in when you listen to dark side of the moon you don't just put you know the first two tracks on you you end up oh well, let me hear that you know you just you end up on the journey mm -hmm. and that's it for me I, if we've made an album that will give people an hour when they will just want to be taken through that whole journey in an audio way, then that's that would be my my dearest hope. And the second thing is an album that stands the test of time. I think we've I think the layers of music are so uh, are, are very significant in there. There's lots of motifs and themes. I think people will be picking up on those for years to come because I've forgotten some of them. Uh, to be honest, you know, there's there's a lot going on there. So I hope, like Sunny England by the Pound. Um, I hope it's an album that people will. I'm not trying to compare it to Sunny by the Pan. I would never be so rude. You know, that's a that's a masterpiece. But but I hope it's an album that people will put on uh, in the next few years and think actually, oh, I've discovered something new here. I've heard it 50 times, and there's still something coming to me. That's what that's what we'd like. I think that's the mark of a great album. I think uh, something that can surprise you years after you first heard it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, I know one cool thing is that you're going to have some uh, some live dates on this side of the pond. I, I had Nick DiVirgilio on the show uh, about uh, probably a month and a half ago, and he he talked about how great it was that you guys finally had to make the uh, transatlantic flight to, uh, <laughs> to the U.S. And uh, I'm trying to get up uh, to at least one of the New Jersey shows because you're, you're I, I live in Florida. You're not coming anywhere near no, me. No, sorry about that. But that's okay. The, the, the tough part is I have... Um, I have Steve Hackett tickets on the Monday after you guys play in New Jersey. So it's going to be a, a quick turnaround for me. Okay. Oh, what for <laughs> Steve Hackett tickets in Florida? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. Crikey. That is a quick turnaround, isn't it? Yeah. So yes. Okay. All right. But well, hopefully I'll I be hope... able to get to catch you. Cause I haven't been. Yeah. I hope to meet you in the flesh there. It'd be good to see you. Uh, Gregory spot. And this is, has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you so much for telling me about the likes of us comes out March 1st on inside out music. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best of success. It, it, you know, it, David is gone, but uh, Albert Alberto does a great job, and and it sounds like a big, big train album. It sounds like a very good, big, big train album. So thank you for telling me about it. 
Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Thanks for your time.